Okay. I'll give you the floor. All right. Uh, Dr. Saltzman, Ava, if you can't hear me or can't see what I'm doing, you're not missing. <laughs> but let me know. Okay. So, like Jim so kindly mentioned, my idea or what I'm working with is going to be breaking chalk. Let's try that again. I'm chalkist, so how I thought you graduated. Okay, so I'm going to presume that you guys know what we're doing here. Um, typically, single objective programming wants to minimize f of x subject to d of x less than or equal to zero x in r to the n, where n is some number. So what we wind up having there, you get some constraints here. Okay, we want this to be convex. All right, that is smaller, smaller than possible, just so that the people on Zoom can't see it. Um, we want this to be convex. And we're pretty much good to go. Other things we can shift around a little bit, but that's what we've got. If I knew we had such small water bottles. I well, I am. And so if we have that, okay, that's great. That's single objective program. Now, now some of the stuff, some of the other stuff that we can work with would be, I just really like the acronym for this. You have two options. You can say multi-objective optimization or multi-objective programming. My mom owned this cat. He was this Norwegian forest cat, Maine Coon thing, lived in central Georgia. So he was just grouchy all the time. So I would call him the mop. So when I saw that it was multi-objective programming, I was like, yes. But anyway, what does that mean? Well, come from here, carry it over, you get minimize F1 of X. F2 of X, et cetera, until the cows come home. F, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Fm of X, subject to some set of constraints. G of X less than or equal to zero. Now, I know I've mentioned to you some sort of linear optimization. Do you know math programming at all? Yeah. Okay, great. Awesome. Everybody else in the grass, if you don't know it, you deserve what you get. So X to the R and pretty much the same thing, except now you're running into the problem that there is no one solution. If there is one solution, then we break it down to this and we're off to the race. So as mathematicians, we don't care. So we're going to assume FI, and F today, conflict. For instance, Fi might be the grad student wants to minimize how long he's in the program. Fj might be that the, the grad student's advisor wants to maximize the number of publications that the graduate student creates. Guess what? In all likelihood, those are going to conflict. Fi, Fj. And so as you minimize Fj, that results in eventually maximizing Fi and vice versa. So that's what we've run into in multi objective program. Now, which one you care about? It very much depends. Are you talking to the grad student or are you talking to the, um, to the grad advisor? So as a result, how you decide what's best, who's to say? The way we mathematicians work with it, say, oh yeah, there's a field for that. If you want that, you've got MCDM, multi-criterion decision-making, MCDA, multi-criterion decision analysis. There's a slight difference. If you wanna know about those, there are three people that are far smarter than I am on this. Um, I hope it's that's his name, right? 
Philip DeCastro. I'm going to get her name wrong. Raki Goswami. And Kesa. I'm assuming she's still sad because she hasn't, I don't think she's gotten married yet. I think she's engaged, but not married. These are all my academic siblings. Then, honestly, if you've seen Peter Lescarbon, I think he's taking the class. Sarah Kelly's taking the class. Um, there's a there's a handful of grad students around that you, you can talk to. They'll probably be able to tell you about this far better than I can. But this is what we do to decide what's best. Putting the little observing fingers right there. At any point, if I don't make something clear, please stop me. Like I mentioned earlier, if I tell an off color joke, you can throw something at me. But if I'm just making things unclear, stop me. That goes for you too on Zoom. So FCDM, MCDA, in general, as mathematicians, I refuse to use the um, refuse to use the slang y'all, but as math folks, what we prefer to do <laughs> is if you pretty much everything. and walk off. So we'll give you the entire set of what we call optimal, and then we'll let you decide what's optimal in your case. And that's where MCDM and CDA and their sub-schools come into play. So the concept, I need to go through some definitions because I'm a mathematician, it's what I do. So what we have, now over here for the single objective case, it's pretty clear. Oh, yeah. The best is what makes F smallest. We're minimizing. You could be maximizing what makes F the largest. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe this is unbounded. Maybe it just goes on forever. Maybe this never occurs. It's infeasible. Fine, whatever. But there's a conclusion there. Here, if there's a conclusion there, we mathematicians don't care. So we only care when there's conflict, when there's something wrong occurring. So what we have is the notion of, and, and this is going to get messy. You can imagine that these parentheses are upside down. So when one of them is there, the other one isn't. So the efficient, that's yeah, right, I don't want to do this. Solution looks as follows. I was worried when my advisor found out that I was actually giving this talk because she's, I'm one of the best demo key people in the world, I think. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I think there was a very prestigious award that she got. And so I was like, oh no, she's going to get me when I mix up weekly efficient and efficient. If I draw it on paper, if I just draw a picture, I won't. <laughs> so if we have F1 of X, F2 of X, you would have these solutions. So these are going to be, I might not actually have this written right, but an efficient solution is there is nothing better than it. That's the slant, that's the colloquial way of putting it. Better or as good as that means if F is if F2 is best here, any other solution is going to have F1 be worse. 
Or if any other solution has F2 better, then step one is going to necessarily be worse. And that's kind of this line that we form right there. Nothing's outright where both of them are better. You minimize F1 and F2. So that doesn't exist if these are efficient. Weakly efficient, just to make an utter hash of things, is weaker, nothing better. So that means that basically, okay, this guy isn't better. He's as good as and not worse. Now I know this keeps going up, but that's essentially what the idea is. Efficient, nothing better, or as good as, weakly, nothing better. So from there, that's our notion of optimal now. So we have this concept of optimal, and from there we now need to figure out, okay, great, how do I get that out of this? Let me see if I make sure I didn't skip anything. Okay, I am skipping how to solve these guys. That's somebody else's problem. I've never read that series. Collecting objectives, define optimal, weak efficiency. Okay, this thing, this set of efficient solutions, we call that the Pareto, did I get this right? Set. I think if you work with too many engineers, you'll start calling it Pareto front. I won't fault you for that too much. Um, Pareto set. Okay. So as far as any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns, things I might have missed, messed up, opportunities for maybe you guys, yourself to feel more intelligent. Truthfully, I'm just gonna go grab more water. Okay, so the objective now, just as a reframe, probably just put this over here, forget about it, but then never erase it. I might even write, do not erase, see how long it exists. But our objective, is to find, describe, whatever you want to call it, the Pareto set. Because that's what we want to give to people and let them decide, okay, when do, what do I want to work with? What do I choose? Grad student wants five years, advisor wants four papers. Well, maybe it's going to have to be six years and three papers or something like that. Figure out some sort of compromise, I guess. Honestly, there's also one more thing. This is the ideal point. And that is the global minimum of F2 as an SOP, global minimum of F1 as an SOP. If the ideal point can be attained, then there's no issues and we don't care. As mathematicians, we don't care. Somebody else works at it. So our objective is to find the Pareto set To assume that they can see that. And so there's a variety of methods for doing that. And this is probably something I could talk about till the cows come home. Um, so if I can remember from getting myself too deeply embroiled in this, most of these so what that means is we're going to introduce extra numbers and we're going to set them as constants so there's a couple different ways that you can go about this one thing you can do I put her like a Anybody have any ideas on one of the ways we can do this? Okay, that's fine. So one of the things we can do is mush everything together. <coughs> so 
So it's not called a con convex combination. We call it the weighted sum method. So rather than minimize F1x, F2x, et cetera, et cetera, blah, 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 you can minimize lambda 1 F1 of X plus lambda 2 F2 of X plus plus lambda M F M of X. I think that's typically used as R in the literature, actually, but I'm going to use M because I've already started. <laughs> And you still have the same constraints. Respect to x subject to g out of x less than or equal to zero. X. I don't need to write that. X in R n. So you can minimize that. And I guess you don't actually have to do this, but you can can reweight it. So we just typically do. The sum of lambda i equals one, lambda i in zero one. So that's kind of just that's why I said convex combination. Technically speaking, you don't need to, but essentially, okay, which one do we care about? Let him, the one that we care more about, gets a heavier weight, the rest dwindle, and we go closer to that one. It turns out. I think it's for every combination of lambda that will get you a point here. This is a scalarization method because typically you will, I would imagine, pick like a hundred lambdas, throw the optimization software at them, see where it lands, and say, all right, guys, you have a hundred points to pick from, knock yourselves out. So that's probably my, would I say favorite method? I wouldn't say favorite. The problem with this is when you're doing that, that lambda can introduce some complications. As long as they're constant, it's fine. If, for instance, you want something a little bit more advanced rather than, oh, I don't want them constant, let's see what we can start considering it. Well, not probabilistically, but let's let lambda say a variable itself. That starts getting into issues because is this still convex? Is that still convex? Questions. So another method that we could do is use the fact that these over here are all in conflict. One of them is the advisor desires, one of them is the grad student's desires, conflict. This is just a hypothetical. So the other thing we can do is use that conflict, and this is called the Epsilon constraint. Method. The thing we can do here is, again, you knock it down to an SOP. I'm just going to pick F1, but it really doesn't have to be. It can be any one of those. Minimize F1, subject to. You still have that g of x less than or equal to zero. And then you have f2 of x less than or equal to epsilon. I'm going to mark it epsilon 2 just because it matches with f2. f3 of x less than or equal to epsilon 3 and so on. Idea being, now instead of picking weights up here, you're going to do the same thing. Let's pick these epsilons. I don't want to be publishing, or I don't want to be taking longer than six years. If that happens, I walk. That, that sort of thing. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we do with this is I don't want these guys to go past this point, past this point. Taking another example that I actually have a toy example on, 
you could be minimizing risk for investment, but maximizing return. You don't want your risk to go over a certain point. That's essentially what this is. Same as before, as you fiddle with these epsilons, you're going to get this Pareto set. And same as before, again, it's a scalarization because you pick 100 different epsilons and you say, all right, here's your points. Have fun. Now, some of these are also going to give you weekly efficient as well. I'm kind of glossing over that because that's where my head starts spinning, even though those are easier to find. And sometimes they're okay. Sometimes that's all you need. The nice part about these, at least the part that I like about it being more mathematical, but not, is you can now go play Legos with them. So you can have, I think we called it, and neuralized. Weighted sum. Just take those and mush them together again. If I recall correctly. I know that this is a method. I'm not entirely certain that this is the name of it. I will go check. But I'm pretty sure that's what we call it. Or that's what it's called in the literature, one of the two. So we're still minimizing, but now sum or not, sum i equals one to k. And I'm just picking one, it could shift around of lambda i f i of x subject to you have the Pay no attention to my pettiness. G of x less than equal to zero. We just got to keep this guy sticking around. And we're still minimizing with respect to x. And g of x less than equal to zero. And then you have the f i, technically j, fj of x less than or equal to epsilon j. J in K plus one up through N. Why would you might be want to do this? Like I mentioned before, if you've got, for instance, a specific example, some of these might not conflict as much or at all. Different risks might be able to be related and might need mushing together. But you don't want your return to fall below a certain point. Or, yeah, negatives. Whee! Um, you don't want the other guys to break. But maybe these are somewhat related. So it's worth putting together. There's another one, modified hybrid. Now I'm really worried that I've mixed these two up. I have mixed these two up. I think that's the modified hybrid. I'm going to catch it, but whatever. Modified hybrid method. You've hybridized them. Um, let's see if I can actually recover this. I've mentioned it. The general life weighted sum then. Basically somewhat similar. Basically the same in fact. I equals one to k lambda i f i of x e of x plus than equal to zero r n subject to rather than this, you could have some chunk of them. I'm just gonna flatten it all right there. So you have subject to the summation. And I'm just going to use mu because it's not lambda, but it follows the same gut. Mu j f 
j of x less than or equal to epsilon. I'm only using one, so I'm only going to use the one x. I don't know. You can't see it because of that. I'll move that when I'm done. J equals k plus one to m. Again, these could be split up. I'm not because I'm lazy. If I recall correctly, D. That helped a little bit. If I recall correctly, this one pretty much is definitely guaranteed to yield weakly efficient. I haven't looked very closely at it to get to remember if it's efficient enough, but I'm pretty sure we didn't get that far. So, again, you can go play Legos with these, which is kind of nice. Um, <clears throat> as far as I'm aware, there's not very, there's a couple papers out there using modified hybrid. I think there's one that tacked this one on as an afterthought. These, I should really say, I'm not gonna, again, mea culpa. Gonna catch dots for this. I think Haynes did the epsilon constraint. I think Jalkin did the did the weighted sum. These are classical results. Um, I'm terrible, but I know that these are I mean, classical. I mean, like I mean, like roughly probably fifty years ago. Okay, I, to the point where I should not be having to <clears throat> cite that this is not my work because everybody should know that it's not my work. So it's not like hundred years ago, like our lovely, thank you for the RSA version type of thing, right. but it's, not me and I don't really need to be saying, look, this has a proof. It's just, no guys, Joffrey, no guys, Hanks. Um, so those, these are mixing and matching. Those are the classical results. I think those are by and large what are used. Um, just pick a mess of lambdas, <clears throat> throw them at the board, and you're off to the races. Um, if you're not quite there, if somebody somewhere needs to feel like he's in charge, then you tell him which one he wants to pick. He says, oh no, you know, I think cost is a, is a real, he's a real, deal breaker here. So let's try to keep costs from rising above. Then you're going to set the epsilon as he says, and you come back to it. Um, so that's the general gist of it. So having said that, I am going to go ahead and share a bit of a picture, which I did not pull up because shame on me. While you're Great. Oh, we've got Chrome. Control Shift N over the login. Yeah, and I'm just going to do that for you. Because I don't want to show you, the, oh, hush. Because I don't want to show you the mess that is my overly over. That's why. I won't show 20 more. Okay. Um, buttons. It's been forever in a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Share the screen. Hello, screen. Menu. Turn my PDF. All right. Well, it'll be sufficient. That's not going to work. Control L is something different here. Uh, okay. That's not what I want. Oh, well. 
I'm not gonna go exploring your, your documents. I just prefer room. Six to one half dozen of you, like, fine then. Can I try? No, 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 I can't. I just remember Dr. Vitek said there was something funny somewhere where they started messing up PDFs, et cetera, so I'm not even gonna look. Okay, so this is a talk that I gave several years ago. Two years ago is several, it's enough to say it's a lot. So multi-objective multi quadratic programs, parameters in general locations, Ignore the thing about parameters, we don't care. I'll get there when I get there. Let me see, I think I said. Okay, weighted sum is Joffrey. The other one is Haynes. Great. IR vindicated. Reduced epsilon constraint. That was the one, reduced epsilon constraint, not generalized. Makes sense, because I reduced it. I'm still probably going to catch heck for this. Okay. Well, again, ignore the thetas, even though they're everywhere. We don't care. Um, so the idea here, Jim, there's, yeah, there's Chris. No, let's zoom out a little bit because I want to see the whole thing. Okay. Okay, so the idea here is you have your stock choices X, your risks are F1 and F2, and then you negate the return because we want to maximize it, so we're minimizing the negative, F3. Q1, Q2, this theta, again, it's something that's changing because we don't know what the return exactly will be. Just looking over that for a second, we, were, we took the example of 16. So imagine the theta said 16. So these are our quadratic matrices, or these are our quadratic forms. This is our line of returns. Again, we're just trying to keep it somewhat simple. You have to invest all the money, and you can't invest a negative amount of money. So what winds up happening, oh dear, did I not? Okay. So one thing that you get, and I'm gonna zoom in some more, this is using an algorithm that we found for working with uncertainty. This provides the, I think I said this is the epsilon constraints. Epsilon constraint problem, yeah. So we have epsilon one, epsilon two. We're trying to maximize F3 with respect to epsilon one and epsilon two, where in this case, Epsilon one goes with risk one, epsilon two goes with risk two. So you can see that this is F3 in terms of F1 and F2. Notice that this is going to provide a wide array of numbers. What these are, just because the algorithm that we were working with is a linear interpolation. So each of these guys is flat. It's like, okay, in this area, if you have epsilon one and epsilon two over here, then you're going to be able to quickly evaluate F3 by plugging it into this linear approximation. Other stuff. The actual set, and I thought I had it, but I didn't. My co-author of this wound up running an actual problem or the actual analytic solution of the analytic number can be, and got to these four points, so that black area and up to there. Again, it's not drawn, but that's what it's following. That's the Pareto set for this. That's the best we've got. And we call it out, okay, A, B, C, and D to kind of highlight, okay, this is the approximation guy. Okay, sorry, folks life, you guys are too young. Um, and then we said, okay, this is what's coming from the real and from the reality. This is what we've got from our approximation. Notice that we have a whole bunch of extra stuff. That's all weak efficiency as opposed to efficiency, downside of our approximation. But this is something along the lines of what you might do. So 
I think, I mean, I could go through this, but I really don't want to. Yeah. So that's the example that I have on application of the weighted sum using an approximation because shame on me, I didn't pull Kubu's actual figures. I couldn't pull out that, that paper, but so that sifting through that would be. <laughs> so thoughts, comments, questions, concerns. That's kind of it for me. That's the general gist of multiple objective programming, <laughs> how we started, what we're working with. The actual smart people and some of the methods that we might hand to the engineers. And then if they want to do more, then again, we'll point them to said smart people. So I actually finished that a lot quicker than I expected. But then again, there was about a third of the people. And honestly, I would start a bantering with Peter. So. <laughs> All right. Any questions? So I do have a question for that uh, number four. Uh, yeah, yeah. Formulation. So the mu there would be, uh, there would be arbitrary or how same do you... same thing as that. Did I go it's away? just it's still going to be a convex okay. weighted sum. It's going to be so we're minimizing lambda. I was using mu because sometimes I overload things. Sometimes I try not to. So mu j sum is equal to one. And mu j is in <laughs> zero one. Again, just like with lambda, where you don't have to, but you could then divide out by the total and get there anyway. Same for that. So I'm going to go ahead and flip this up just because. You got to press it for a second. Yeah, I just realized, you know, it says it right there. But I'm only great yeah, this yeah, semester. To turn it on, we've got to touch it. Touch it. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? Yes, Claire. I mean, it's a dumb question, but other than the Pareto set, those other dots that you drew, is there any time we would like care what those are? These guys? Yeah. Funnily enough, yes. Um, there's a huge thing in as far as depending on the depending on what you're doing, you don't necessarily like you saw that I was using a linear approximation. Um, honestly, you might not need to be right on the best. You might just need to be close enough. I don't think they call it pseudo-optimal, but they might. But I think they call it epsilon optimality because for some reason, I think it's because epsilon is like E, so, but everything gets epsilon. So as long as you're close enough to the best, you're within epsilon of the best, maybe that's better for them. Um, you'll get some folks that think they're smart that start talking about choosing second best type of thing. They're really just doing prioritizing a, a different objective function. And so if they're only thinking about that, then they'll they'll try to take one of those with that objective function they didn't have in the first place. So yes, you will care about those. Because if you're finding the, those are typically a lot easier to find. So there is a lot of, I can't say a lot. There is definitely work on um, epsilon optimality. So it's just like easier, I guess. You don't have to pay as many. <laughs> as many really, yeah. We don't have to stop at maybe 100 iterations. Or especially there's one algorithm out there. I have stories, but. No, I don't know what the N and the S stand for. I should, but genetic algorithm. I think the N is <coughs> non-dominated, non-dominated something genetic algorithm. And what it does is it takes a bunch of points. It shakes the box and it lets them sink into the cracks. And it takes those points that sank and it shakes them again. And eventually it gets close enough. So you don't have to, if you're looking only for epsilon optimality, you only have to shake the box 500 times instead of 1,000 times or something like that. The general idea of this is they use mutations, which essentially is they take the numbers and they put them into their binary forms. So if you have X, that can be represented as Y. 
whatever that number is. So to mutate So to mutate that, mutate rather than doing some actual like iterative gradient step, which is what the, we mathematicians tend to think. Oh, uh, they'll say, eh, that's not fast enough. One, two, three, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'll swap those. Simple bit switching, bit switching so it can be done a lot. And then they just now they have their new x3 and x4 and they throw those in and see what happens and if it's better then they take that and they just take the best thousand points and they merge them together like that so they use something that's fast and it's essentially relying on the fact that if you're on a like a they celebrate it because if you have a function like that, minimizing that is obnoxious. What's the actual minimum? Well, I think it's down here. How are you going to find that? You might get stuck here. The idea being, okay, if I take all those points, start merging them together, well, they're all going to merge down to here, down to here, down to here, and I'm only going to have those, and then I can take the rest of that. So it's essentially a repeated intuitively i don't think there's a proof for this but intuitively it's a repetition of the binary it's been so long but that cutting i can't remember it for the lightning right now so um it's from i would say 860 but it's computation math, computational math antonio do you remember nope. okay Bisection? Bisection method, double method, pardon my French. Um, is the bisection method re repeated? So, binary bisection, sure. So, that would be one of the other things that they do where, okay, if we're only doing this a thousand times, we're going to call it quits. We don't want this too far. We're going to just do maybe 500 and we'll be good. So, other thoughts, comments, questions, concerns from the almond flower gallery. Oh, as a comment, I think this S stands for sorting. Sorting. Okay, thank you. Which is really weird. <laughs> sorting comes in. Yeah. You know what? I'm about to Google that. So do you uh do you know what ND3 cake cutting is? Say it again. The answer is no. ND3 cake cutting. ND3 cake cutting. This is it's it's I can't, and I'm going to guess that it's something along the lines of make sure nobody is it sounds like one of those voting algorithms that a very long time ago Drew Lipman talked about. Right, right. So it's like so. The solution to this is you want to you want to divide a cake between two people, and you want everybody to be nobody to be unhappy is probably the better way to do it. So the solution is problem. So if Andrew and I divide the cake, yeah, I right. cut it in two, and he gets to pick which piece he wants. Then nobody has any envy. As you go to three people and higher, this is this becomes more complicated. But there's algorithms for it. So my question is. Do you ever do optimization like this where because in the in the cake free there's like there's there are two steps even for two people mm -hmm. there's a cutter and then somebody makes a decision right for three people it's more complicated because the first person cuts it into what that person thinks is thirds and if the second person thinks the two largest are equal then you can finish it there by letting the third person pick then the first uh, then the second the first. Uh, but if not, then somebody's got to shave off the difference. And it, so the question is, it, it, it occurs to me that there are optimization problems that come in stages or oh, in queries like this. And so can you apply this stuff in that in that sense to you? Stages? I think Philip's doing the more of the stage stuff. Okay. So I think he would be a far, far more brilliant yeah. than this goes. But more to your cake, uh, cake question. Um, I don't know how often this happens, but my immediate thought when you introduce more people would be figure out how many pieces each person gets. And then what you would essentially do is cut it into people times the number of pieces. So if there are three people, rather than having, it's like everybody gets two pieces now. So cut it into six. First person gets to pick, then second, then third gets to pick two, then second, then first. And that way you get your first pick, but it gets balanced by 
kind of like that. Okay, if I'm the third person, I get to pick both my both my pieces. Neither of them are going to be phenomenal, but I'm not going to be left over with the dregs like Mr. Burns. Right, but that's how they do it in some card games. So that's what I that's what I thought of. But like I said, that's the yeah. But, but the question is, is that, or, or, I'm not convinced that's MV3, right? Because I've played a lot of cards, and, uh -huh. and you're never MV3 playing cards. <laughs> that would be my my thought process, though. Because it's like, okay, I gotta, yeah, I'm going last, but I get to make it the best. Like I can, I can actually make sure I don't have to worry about somebody taking. Like they took my first piece, great, but once I get my piece, I get the entire of it. Like I can. I can guarantee my chunk of cake, whereas these people have uncertainty of what am I going to do? He has uncertainty. Right. What he can and what you want at the end of the day is for every participant to think that they've got at least the best deal. Right. right? And so I was like, well, I got shafted, but at least he got shafted now. So, yeah, so as far as the, as far as the park games, it's like, Settlers of Catania. Yeah, see, that sounds like politics now. <laughs> I, I told you, it's not just voting on it. I would say talk to Philip about that specifically because I think that's part of MV3 goes. You'd have to probably introduce an extra constraint or an extra objective function that this person or this, honestly, I would say it goes and becomes an extra objective function if I had to guess. Okay, other questions? All right, thanks for showing up. Let's thank Andrew again. Thank you. Andrew. Not a problem. Uh, any questions out there? I guess probably not. All right, everybody, have a good weekend. We've got an interesting one next week because actually we've got a, a, a tandem speaker. Um, Eliza Gallagher and Neil Calkin are actually going to talk about um, they're, they're going to talk kind of about mathematical games.